We're continuing our series of study through this letter. And our theme through 2 Corinthians is strength in weakness. And this morning's theme in particular is strength in weakness through suffering. We're in a season of suffering, aren't we? With the pandemic. And even if you haven't contracted it, there's suffering that we've had to face. For some of us, it may be the suffering of wearing a face covering. Uh, for some of us, it may be the, the suffering of, of being out of work for a season. There, there's all, and then there's the normal sufferings of life and the abnormal sufferings of life. And if we're to follow Christ faithfully, we need to have a healthy theology of suffering. I think I've told you the story before, but I'll refresh your memories if you forget it. Uh, there is a best-selling book in Australia, actually the best-selling book of all time in Australia. And uh, in the introduction to that book, they tell the story or a legend or the myth of a certain kind of bird. Uh, this bird, from the time it leaves the nest, is searching for a particular tree. And when this bird finds this particular tree... It sings one single solitary song, more beautiful than any bird has ever sung any place on the earth. What's interesting is, according to the legend, this bird only sings the song once. You see, this bird searches for a thorn tree, and finding one, it flitters about the dangerous branches And then it finds in that tree the longest, sharpest spike. And finding the spike, it impales itself on the thorn. And dying, rising above its own agony, it sings the sweetest solitary song that it could ever sing. And then dies. While it's singing the song, the earth gets still and listens. And God in the heavens smiles, not at the suffering, but at the song. This is another instance where truth is stranger and more beautiful than fiction. The book that's the best-selling book in Australian history is called The Thorn Birds. But the book I'm talking about, where truth is more beautiful than fiction, is the Bible. And the theme of the Bible is a man who comes to earth and he waits his entire life for a moment when he faces death on a tree being pierced by humanity and being pierced he sings the sweetest song the earth has ever heard And the world becomes still to listen. And God in the heavens smiles, not at the suffering, but at the song. The song of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. And then in this passage in 2 Corinthians 4, we learn that our stories actually parallel the legend of the thorn bird in some way. And they certainly parallel the life, death, and resurrection of Christ if we know Jesus Christ. And what we learn in the passage today is that as we embrace suffering, we don't look for it, we don't search it out, we don't find something to impale ourselves on. That would be ridiculous. But God ordains suffering. And when we embrace it, our lives represent 
or portray to the world the death of Christ on the cross. And as we embrace that suffering and the world stands still to listen, God pours out unique grace on us so that the world also sees represented the resurrection of Christ. And the God in the heavens smiles. Not at our suffering. God never smiles at our suffering. But he smiles at the song that our suffering creates by his grace so that the world may see through our lives the message of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the redemption of the world. So with that as a backdrop, let's all stand out of reverence for God's word and follow along as I read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 18. Uh, this is God's word. But we have this treasure, it's talking about the gospel, in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. May God bless the hearing and teaching of His inspired, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative Word. This is God's Word. He gave it to us because He loves us. And He wants us to have an abundance of hope as we experience hardship, trouble, trial, pain, and suffering in this life. Let's pray. Father, if we only knew the amount of suffering in this room right now, it might be a troubled marriage, it might be broken families, it might be poor health, physically, mentally, emotionally, psychologically, it might be vocational issues. Father, we need hope this morning. God, even as we go through this pandemic, we need to not lose heart. So Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. So four songs that God enables and empowers us and inspires us to sing when we face suffering. First of all, embrace suffering to sing of the power of God. Look at verse 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power is not from us, but from God. The treasure is the gospel. And we are those jars of clay. Now in the first century, 
uh, where this sort of uh, figure of speech comes from. In the first century, they had thieves and robbers just like we have. And when people left their home, uh, sometimes robbers would come into the, to the hut, to the home. And so people would hide their valuables. They didn't have a safe. And they hid their valuables, their treasures, in places that would be least likely to be checked out by the robbers. And so they often used just very plain, ordinary, cracked, chipped, fragile clay pots. And they were hoping that robbers in a hurry wouldn't think about looking someplace so ordinary. And their valuables would be protected. Well, Paul is saying the light of the gospel is the treasure, and we are clay vessels that hold the light. We are broken. We are chipped. We are fragile, and we're very ordinary. And the reason God entrusts us with the gospel is precisely so people would recognize the power doesn't come from us, but from a living God who is really there. When it comes to this treasure of the gospel and the sufferings that we face, uh, this is a little bit of a different point in chapter 4 than what we saw in chapter 1. In chapter 1, we learned about suffering and affliction And the lesson was for us. God allows suffering so that we wouldn't rely on ourselves, but instead would trust in God, hope in God, who raises the dead. Okay, 2 Corinthians 1, same sufferings being talked about, but the focus is us not relying on ourselves, but on God. In 2 Corinthians 4, The purpose of the suffering is so that people would see that we are ordinary, normal, broken, fragile, chipped people. And the world outside of us would learn that there is a power in us that is not of ourselves, but comes from God. And then Paul gives examples of the kinds of sufferings that we will experience in this life. And he goes on to then give the kind of power we experience so that we wouldn't lose hope. And as the world sees us suffering affliction and sees us dealing with the suffering, they will see that God is real. Again, God sends sufferings so that our lives would reflect the cross of Christ. And as God's power works through us in the midst of our suffering, the world would not only see the reality of the crucifixion, they would also see the reality of the resurrection. And they would believe. So look at verse 8. Paul says we're afflicted but not crushed. Now that word afflicted means intense pressure. It it means almost being crushed. I think I've told you before, remember that that illustration from Star Wars, the very first one back in the the late 70s? And uh, the the four main characters, uh, Chewie and Han Solo and uh, Princess Leia and Luke, they were in this trash compactor. Uh, on one of the spaceships, and the wall started closing in on them. And R2-D2, the the droid, was trying to work the computer so that the walls would stop crushing in, and they were getting pressed more and more. That's the word affliction, being pressed more and more and more by trials that could be physical, emotional, mental, psychological, vocational, relational, financial, all of the kinds of pressures you could imagine. And finally, R2-D2 was able to to cause the walls to come back. And that's where Paul says, afflicted, pressured, but not crushed. God in His sovereignty will ordain pressures, but He will never allow us 
to be crushed so that the world will simultaneously see our lives portraying the crucifixion, but also representing the resurrection. And then in verse 8, it says, perplexed, but not despairing. Uh, That word perplexed means to be so confused, to be so brought to the end of ourselves that we are at a complete loss of what to do next. We are so overwhelmed by pain and struggle that we're at a loss of what to think or what to say or what to do. Perplexed, but not despairing. In other words, the play on words would be this. At a loss without ever being lost. We're never finally lost. We're just at a loss Temporarily, That's what the power of God in us will enable us to do through suffering. Verse 9, persecuted but not forsaken. That, that word persecuted means to be chased by a wild animal. You can picture wild animals in a, in a forest or wild animals in a desert, but that's not really what Paul's talking about. Paul most likely is thinking of the Colosseum in Rome under the persecution perhaps of Nero or someone a bit earlier. And he's picturing Christians being chased for sport by wild animals to be mauled and torn apart. And Paul is saying that even when we're chased by wild animals, we will not be forsaken. God will never leave us. He will never, ever forsake us. See, sometimes in the midst of suffering, isn't our first temptation that God has abandoned us? When when I face suffering, I have a tendency to think, okay, this is because I've been bad. And if I could just figure out why God has sent the suffering, because obviously He's wanting to correct me over something, that if I discovered the key as to why God sent this suffering, then he'll remove it. And so I spend my entire time trying to think through, why has God abandoned me to suffering? But see, in the Scriptures, God presents a theology of suffering for the Christian. And he says, I'm not ordaining suffering because you've been bad. I'm ordaining suffering because you are a jar of clay that holds the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you suffer, you portray the cross to the watching world. And as you embrace the suffering, I send my power into you and you also represent and portray the resurrection. We can't avoid suffering because it is part of God's plan for the Christian. Struck down but not destroyed. That's a boxing analogy. It means knocked down but not knocked out. In in the boxing ring with evil in this broken world, we're going to be knocked down time and time and time again. We're going to get sucker punched. We're going to get beat behind the head with an with a unfair punch. And we're going to be knocked down. But God says by His power we'll never be knocked out. He is for us. And then notice what it says twice in verses 10, 11, and 12. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. You see this? You understand what I'm saying now? As Christians who suffer, we are portraying the cross. That, if, if you go away with one thing, please go away with this. God ordains suffering for the Christian so that the world would see the cross. They don't even know they're seeing the cross most of the time. But God, by His Spirit, is working on hearts in the world through our suffering so that Christ and the crucifixion is portrayed and presented. 
And then as we experience God's power, the resurrection is also presented. Look what it says. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. Verse 11, always given over to death. Notice 10 and 11, always. You know what that means in the Greek? Always. Always. That, that it is part of a calling of a Christian. We don't seek out suffering, right? We don't jump in front of a truck and say, okay, now I'll be in intensive care for eight weeks. No, God ordains suffering as part of the normal Christian life. Now listen, do I like to be talking like this and teaching like this from Scripture? You bet I don't. I don't like suffering any more than the next person does. But there's no way around it. Suffering has been ordained for the follower of Christ so that the cross would be portrayed to the culture. And as we embrace our suffering and the power of God's at work within us, they would also see the resurrection portrayed. Leading to verse 12. So death is at work in us as the church. But life is at work in our culture as we experience suffering and portray the death and resurrection of Christ. That will transform your view of suffering. It won't make it hurt any less, but it will put it in the perspective of God's sovereign purpose. Embrace suffering to sing of the power of God. Secondly, embrace suffering to sing of the hope of grace. If you look at verse 13, Paul is quoting Scripture. And if you use your cross-references in your Bible, or if you have a study Bible, the note will surely point you to Psalm 116. In Psalm 116, the psalmist is under great affliction, great trial. The psalmist is experiencing great pain in suffering. And he says... I believed when I spoke, colon, I am in great affliction. In other words, Psalm 116, verse 10, I believed even when I spoke, I am in great affliction. In other words, the psalmist had hope in God's grace, even in the midst of great affliction. And Paul says that same spirit of faith is in him, and he's saying, as application to the Corinthians and to us, that same spirit of faith is in each one of us. So that even when we go through excruciating pain and suffering, by God's spirit and grace, we will say, even now I believe. Even now I have hope. It's just like Job, right? Job had everything anybody could want in this life. And Satan asked for permission to sift him, to test him. And God gave Satan permission. And so Job lost all of his property. He lost all of his crops. He lost all of his livestock, all of his animals. He lost all of his homes. He lost his children and their spouses. And he lost his health as well. And yet, even after Job's wife said to him, curse God and die, will you? Job said, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. We sing of the hope of grace. We're actually to believe as the psalmist believe in Psalm 116, that God will deliver us out of our suffering. Now, this, this is where we get perilously close to health, wealth, prosperity, theology that I'm always saying is wrong. Well, it's wrong in many ways, but health, wealth, prosperity, theology says you'll never go through suffering. It's not God's will for you to suffer. I'm saying exactly the Scripture says just the opposite. It is God's will. For us to suffer. I don't like that. <laughs> I wish there was another way, but scripture couldn't be more clear. 
it falls to us as followers of Christ not only to experience God's grace, but to suffer for Christ. But in that suffering, we will experience great hope. And we are actually to hope until God makes it clear otherwise, we are to trust God to deliver us out of our suffering. He'll use our suffering to portray the cross and to portray the resurrection, but we are to trust God with great hope that He'll pull us through the suffering. And I think sometimes this side of the evangelical church, our side, the the biblical Bible-centered side, the theologically sound side, sometimes we're so afraid of health, wealth, prosperity, and sounding like that, that we don't give each other hope that when you're suffering, listen, really, trust God to get you out of it. We're, We're supposed to do that. Until God proves otherwise, trust Him to get you out of it. But then we're to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them in the book of Daniel? Daniel's friends. The emperor built a great statue and they commanded everybody bow down to it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were faithful to God. They would not bow down. So the king said, heat up the furnace ten times its normal heat and you will bow down. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, look, king, our God is able to deliver us. Okay, that's, that's the, the hope and grace that they had. They're going to trust God to deliver them. And then what's he say next? The same thing Paul says next, basically. But even if God doesn't deliver us, know, O king, that we will not bow down to the statue that you have made. And so Paul says in verse 14, knowing that he who raised Christ will raise us and bring us with you into his presence. Paul's saying, even if God does not deliver me out of my suffering in this life, he ultimately will deliver me. See, this is where the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel people get it all wrong. Health, wealth, and prosperity is in the New Jerusalem, not here. So they, they see the passages that teach health, wealth, and prosperity. They just got the timing all wrong. Where we experience that is the new Jerusalem, not now. See, this is why so many Christians feel like second-class citizens. They're surrounded by health, wealth, prosperity people who are looking down their noses at them. Why are you going through so much? Why are you suffering? You must not be right with God. Isn't that what Job's friends ended up saying? Job, you need to repent. Clearly you're suffering because you're just a mess. No. (laughs) Job was suffering for one reason and one reason only. God ordained him to suffer. There was nothing about Job that would cause God to punish him or discipline him with suffering. God simply ordained that Job would suffer. Now, Job is an example where as he prayed, God did deliver him out of his suffering and gave him more than he'd ever had before that he had lost. But it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes we go from loss to loss to loss, to loss. And from one degree of suffering to a deeper degree of suffering to an even deeper degree of suffering. Now, I hope that's not your experience, but I've known people like that, that their lives appear to me to be almost Job-like. And you feel unworthy to even speak a word in their presence. But God wants us to embrace our suffering and sing of the hope of grace. Verse 15, as grace extends to more and more people, it increases thanksgiving to the glory of God. See, part of our suffering is simply to cause people to thank God over the grace that is poured out on those who suffer. And God receives glory. I I can't tell you how many times I've counseled with people 
usually it's with cancer, but it can be with other things as well. I have a dear, dear friend, uh, my, my Greek professor, uh, all those many years ago. Uh, his wife uh, contracted MS uh, while he was one of my mentors at seminary. And I've been in touch with him, and, and she's, she's still alive, but suffered from MS now for, for over 40 years. And it's just amazing to see how the grace of God, as I talk with people like Jennifer or like other people that have cancer, I can remember a gal, two gals in our church who died from cancer. They, they had cancer, they, they experienced great grace and God's presence and missed the cancer. They were in remission, and while I spoke to them in remission, they said these words. Baba, I almost, almost, I don't, but I almost wanted the cancer to come back. Because I've never experienced Jesus the way I experienced him when I had my cancer. Now, interestingly, in both those cases, the cancer did come back and God did take them home. The point is, there is a unique grace that is poured out on God's servants in the midst of suffering. You don't need to fear it. Can I just tell you, I've lived most of my life afraid of suffering when I was little, I was hyper. I know that's hard for you to believe. But I was just hyper as a cat. And I was always running into things. I guess I wasn't very coordinated either. And I'd, I'd had stitches like, you know, half a dozen times by the time I was six. And they were not good experiences. They were frightening. And I learned really early to teach myself that the world's a dangerous place. That it's not safe. And therefore as sort of an orphan mentality. There's no one's going to take care of me. i got to take care of myself. So I lived my life thinking about five steps down the road of every possible harmful thing that might could happen. And then backing up, I would avoid all those possibilities through my analytical pro approach to life. Well, you can imagine, I was practically neurotic. I really almost am still neurotic. But the point is, I, I lived my life to avoid suffering. And what I realize now is if you live your life to avoid suffering, you're cutting yourself off from one of the greatest means of grace that God makes available to us. Now, of course, it's also ridiculous to think we could even avoid what God ordains, right? So as we embrace the suffering, there will be a very special, unique experience of grace. And God will give you hope. Verse 16, so you do not lose heart. And then i got to speed up here. Thirdly, embrace suffering to sing of the glory of transformation. God uses suffering to transform us into the image of Christ. Okay, so let me summarize all that we've talked about so far. Okay, this is in verse 16. We do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed daily. Here's what we have so far. God ordains suffering for his people. When his people embrace the suffering, the cross of Christ is represented to the culture. As the cross is represented, God pours out his power and his grace upon us so that we have an experience of Christ in the gospel, so that the resurrection is also represented to the culture, to society around us. Now, that would be glorious enough right there. But then Paul goes on to say, not only is the cross presented to culture and the resurrection presented to culture, but as we embrace suffering, we actually experience the power of the resurrection in our own lives. And resurrection begins to occur inside of us. We are made more and more alive to God through Christ by the Spirit. And we experience glory. When you think of the word glory, don't we often think about God only? Like, glory is just something that could be used as an adjective about God, but not us. You know, we're just jars of clay, right? We're just broken, chipped, fragile. 
Well, no, actually, that's not what the Bible says only about us. We are broken, but in Psalm 8, it says we were crowned as image bearers with glory and honor. And in Hebrews 2, we learn that part of the purpose of the work of Christ is actually to restore us to glory. So glory isn't just an attribute of God. It is a shared attribute of God with us. Now, the word glory means brightness or light. And as we embrace suffering and experience resurrection power, we are transformed so that the lightness and brightness of Christ and the gospel would shine more completely through us as we're transformed into the image of Christ. Glory also means weight or substance. It means heavy. And as we embrace suffering, we experience the glory of transformation. We're transformed from one degree of glory to another so that our lives become more heavy and weighty in this world. In other words, our impact increases as God pours out upon us transforming grace. We do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed daily. It's like metamorphosis occurs through suffering. It's like that ugly caterpillar that is stuck on the ground. And it, it's wrapped in the darkness of the cocoon. And something mysterious and wonderful happens in the cocoon. And then out comes a butterfly that never crawls on the ground anymore and flies and sees everything differently and brings beauty to the world. If you're suffering this morning, can you picture it as maybe a cocoon of darkness that is surrounding you for a season? But in the midst of it, God is pouring out transforming grace, and He is increasing your glory through this suffering. And the cocoon of darkness will eventually fall away. And you'll experience a beauty you never dreamed possible. And then fourthly and finally, embrace suffering not to sing of the power of God and the hope of grace and the glory of transformation. Embrace suffering to sing of the preeminence of eternity. You know one of the reasons why God ordains suffering? Because I and perhaps you are much too quick to think that this is home. We actually begin to think that this is home. And God ordains suffering to remind us we're not yet home. Don't seek to be at home here. This isn't home. Verse 17, that God through suffering is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. Jesus, we're told in Hebrews 12, endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? For the joy set before him. Suffering is sent to set our hearts more completely on the new Jerusalem that awaits us. The new heavens and the new earth. And we live in a culture that doesn't have a picture of the new heaven and the new earth. We live in a society that isn't thinking about eternal life. So the only thing our culture that surrounds us thinks about is the here and now. you got to grab for everything you can right now because there is nothing else. And if there is nothing else, then the one thing to completely eradicate from our lives is suffering. Because there is no purpose to it. Let's just wipe it out. But if we have an eternal perspective, we're reminded that this isn't home. And compared to even, God forbid, 
80 years where someone knew nothing but suffering. The glory of eternity makes those 80 years pale by comparison. Please hear what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not saying God minimizes our suffering. Just like the story with the thorn bird, God doesn't smile at our suffering. God doesn't minimize. When it says momentary light affliction, God's not saying, would you please shape up? Your cancer is nothing more than a hangnail. What's your problem? I'm sorry. That, that's not God. Not the God of the Scriptures anyway. God groans with us in our suffering. But lovingly and gently, He also taps us on the shoulder, kisses us on the forehead and says, hey, this isn't home. And as we embrace suffering in light of eternity, the world becomes still and sees the cross and sees the resurrection and we experience transforming grace and we look forward to eternity with Jesus where there will be no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, And God in heaven smiles, not at the suffering, but at the song. Let's pray. Father, I don't know all the kinds of suffering that are being endured in this room right now. God, I know there are marriages that are in trouble. And I know that so many divorces occur, not because there's grounds, but because people aren't willing to embrace the suffering. Lord, there are problems in families with children, and it's incredibly painful. And Lord, we try to fix it instead of realizing we need to embrace the pain and watch you work. Father, the pandemic is all around us, and it creates great pain. But God, may we continue to hope that in great pain comes a great song. Lord, whatever the suffering is that we're experiencing, whether it be physical, whether it be cancer, whether it be MS, whether it be all kinds of other issues, Lord, might we be given the grace, first of all, to know that you care, that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us, you'll never let us be crushed. And then, God, might we... Embrace the role to represent the cross to the watching world, to represent the resurrection, and to experience supernatural transformation. God, if there's anybody here today that doesn't know Christ, (laughs) they, they might be afraid to follow Christ now. I don't know. But Lord, how great would your power be to take a sermon on suffering for following Christ and actually lead people to put their trust in a Savior. God, thank you for your word. Encourage our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.